I'd, love, I'd now like to introduce this morning's um, presenter, Dr. James A. Ben um, from McMaster University in Canada. He received his PhD in 2001 from UCLA and is a professor of Buddhism and East Asian religions at, at McMaster University. He studies Buddhism and Taoism in medieval China with um, a focus on three major areas, um, being practice in Chinese religions, the ways in which people create and transmit new religious practices and doctrines, and religious dimensions of commodity culture. He has published widely in a variety of journals um, on topics of self-emulation, spontaneous human combustion, Buddhist scripture, and tea and alcohol in medieval China. Um, he is the author of a book entitled Burning for the Buddha, Self-Immolation in Chinese Buddhism, um, published in 2007, and another book, Tea in China, A Religious and Cultural History. He's currently working on a translation and study of the Sumamangama Sutra. Um, it's a Chinese um, Buddhist scripture. And so again, we'd like to welcome Dr. James A. Ben, his presentation um, entitled Simmering, Whisking, Steeping, Methods of Preparing and Consuming Tea in Medieval, in Pre-Modern China. So thank you, Dr. Ben, for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and we'll be on our way. Hello everyone, thanks for joining me. Um, I'd much rather we were all in sunny Portland today, but I'm very happy to have this chance to connect with you all wherever in the world you are tuning in from. Um, I'd like to thank my friends at First Saturday PDX for inviting me back for their anniversary year. And here's to the next 20 years. Without further ado, let's get on with the show. It's my pleasure today to share a few thoughts and ideas about the way that tea as a beverage was prepared and consumed in pre-modern China. If you're interested in some of the deeper background of what I'm talking about today, this is the book that I wrote that came out in 2015 and a Chinese translation of it came out last year. Um, I'll spare you the detailed arguments made in the book, but despite claims for 5,000 years of tea history, tea drinking as a widespread cultural practice is essentially an invention of the Tang Dynasty 618 to 907 Common Era, so all my material today will be from the Tang Dynasty or later. Also, I should say that I'll be looking really at the most elite forms of tea appreciation, and this means that We'll be seeing a lot of images of elite men and hearing the voices of elite male tea connoisseurs. If you wonder throughout this presentation, where are the women? Then please invite me back to talk about the female side of tea connoisseurship, which is still largely underrepresented in the scholarship. Well, uh, in essence, this single slide, which features images from the Hong Kong Museum of Teaware, shows the substance of the whole talk. The three main modes of making tea in pre-modern China are simmering, whisking, and steeping. But of course, it really isn't that simple. And uh, this apparent chronological progression in tea preparation is actually quite misleading. It's likely that you could find all these ways of making tea in operation at any one moment in history. Now, because we're all on Zoom and concentration is a difficult thing, um, I would like to abandon any pretense of being able to provide an authoritative overview and instead invite you to join me in an impressionistic journey through some visual and textual materials. I think it's important to recognize that we know much less than we think we do about this topic. And in particular, I'd like to flag now but what looks like the simplest and most familiar form of making tea, steeping it, in fact, turns out to be the most complex and confusing one. Now, a few things that I won't be talking about today. I will not be talking about the history of milk tea, although that's very interesting. I won't talk about Tibetan and Mongolian styles of tea preparation. 
Um, I won't talk about what we call herbal teas. I'm just going to talk about tea made with the leaves of Camellia sinensis and mostly what we call green tea. Um, so I won't talk about tea as a medicine and its consumption as an ingredient in congees and soups. So maybe we can identify roughly four transformative periods, each of which saw the emergence of a particular characteristic of tea culture. Pre-Tang times, uh, the Tang itself, the Sung Yuan period and the Ming Qing. The modern period is beyond the scope of our discussion today, although it's been highly innovative, of course. But we can say that how elite people consumed tea in the Sung was significantly different from how they drank it in the Tang period, while the Ming Qing uh, elites took yet another path. In what I'm calling earliest times, and we really don't know how early it actually was, but when tea, was just a local product of southwest China, tea leaves were plucked as needed for medicine and tea was made with the fresh leaves more or less on the spot. Medical writers noted that the best tea, meaning perhaps the best tasting, the tenderest, the most potent leaf of the tea, should be picked in the late winter and early spring when the tea plant is producing shoots sprouts, buds, and the tiniest tender leaves. Now this season is relatively short, just a few weeks long, and it usually fell during the second and third lunar months. After that flush of growth, only the older or tougher leaves were available until next year's spring harvest. So because spring tea leaves were the ones that were favored, these tea leaves had to be preserved and it seems that there were different ways of doing that, including making pastes or gels from crushed leaves or liquid concentrates or drying loose leaves or compressing the leaves. And we'll talk about cakes of tea in detail in a minute. Now, cake tea is much more complex and labor intensive process than just making kind of compressed tea like you get with modern pu'er tea, for example. It was thought to be so time consuming and expensive that in 1391, the first Ming emperor, who apparently considered uh, cake tea manufacturer a burden on the tea industry and its peasant workers, forbade the making of cake tea and ushered in the popular use of dried whole leaf tea and teapots. This, of course, is the big shift in consumption um, of uh, loose whole leaf tea, which is familiar to us today, because that's what we do today. So let me talk a little bit about the limits uh, to what we can know about tea drinking in pre-modern times. From some points of view, it seems that we have a lot of material. We have textual records, we have the surviving material culture, and after all, we still drink tea, so we, we think we know something about it. But there are still lots of barriers that prevent us from accessing the actual experience of drinking tea as Lu Yu did in the Tang or as Su Shu did in the Song. We can't really make exactly the same tea as they did because we don't have the tea itself. Um, we have modern tea, but not tea as it was grown, picked and processed in Tang or Song times. Drinking tea is also an ephemeral experience. How can we know it? Just at the most basic level, and, and maybe surprising to some of you, we don't have an illustrated manual showing step-by-step step how tea was prepared and drunk. We have to reconstruct that process by inference sometimes. On occasion, the pre-modern tea literature will use technical terms that we actually can't understand today, and this makes it difficult to understand exactly what's going on. However, we do have actual tea utensils. We have visual records such as paintings and murals which depict tea or tea drinking scenes, and we have our textual records. So today, I'll use images and poetry to try and get at the experiential nature of tea drinking. But we should recognize that challenges still remain. Surviving tea utensils are 
inanimate objects. They can't speak to us about tea preparation and appreciation. Paintings only show single moments of tea drinking or tea preparation, and they're not documentary photographs. They're consciously, aesthetically arranged vignettes. Artists are not particularly interested in providing us, uh, modern day people, researchers, with hard evidence. Poems about tea, again, aren't striving for veracity, but they aim to convey a mood and they may use language in heightened ways. So another thing I, I want to note is that drinking tea is one thing, but we also want to know about appreciation of tea, and that requires the tea drinker to approach tea with all four senses of taste, sight, smell, and touch. So multiple layers of cultural values are embedded in tea preparation and tea uh, appreciation. Okay, let's start talking about how to make tea. Um, we'll begin with the method that we know from Tang Times mm -hmm. as described, for example, in Lu Yu's Classic of Tea. But as I said, this method continued to be used well into the 17th century at least. Now this photograph, if you look at it, is actually quite informative. It shows, let me get my uh, pointer here. So it shows a Tang style um, iron cauldron sitting on a, a small brazier here, which is, which is normal, that's what we would see. Uh, the tea master is stirring the boiling water while adding the powdered tea. So from that photograph, it, it seems simple enough. Let's start getting into the details and see how simple it really is. So I've given you here a, a famous Tang poem about tea. It's written in the, in the shape of a Buddhist pagoda. And uh, if you're interested in the Buddhist heritage of tea, then my book will tell you more about that. So here we are, a nice clear reference to tea leaves, tea buds being boiled in a pan, swirled around in a bowl and producing a foam that looks like yellow flowers or green like yeast mold. So this, like all the other poems that I'm going to show today, is, is my translation. Let's talk about process then. By the Tang Dynasty, 618 to 907, um, the finest tea was preserved in the form of caked tea. These cakes of tea were made by steaming tea leaves and then pounding them. The resulting paste of pounded leaves was then formed into cakes of various shapes and sizes in cast iron molds. When they'd set, but they weren't yet totally dry, they were skewered on long splints of bamboo. And in that form, they were dried over slow burning fires. And once they totally dried, humidity of any kind seems to have been the main enemy of, of good tea. The cakes came off the bamboo and were strung together on cords and placed in heated storage, uh, again, to avoid humidity. And now you've got the cakes, they could be sold by weight. Each tea cake weighed less than an ounce, but had hundreds of thousands of leaf buds uh, were required to make each of these cakes. So it's definitely a very labor intensive process. Okay, we now have processed tea in cakes. How do we make our delicious green foamy tea? First, we select our tea cake and we toast it over our tea brazier. And you can see one um, in, the, in the slide here, and you'll see uh, more examples of tea braziers later on today, uh, using bamboo tea tongs. Once the tea is toasted evenly, we're gonna place it in a clean paper bag to cool. And once it's cooled, and again, from the literature, we don't really know exactly how cool is cool. Uh, but once it's cooled, we place the cake into a tea grinder and we crush it uh, to a really fine powder about the consistency of rice flour, so a very fine powder. Then we sieve that powder to make sure that there are uh, no lumps in it and that it's even. So now we have freshly ground tea powder. Okay, we got our tea powder. Now let's get our water ready. So in a cauldron, we're gonna place about a pint of freshly drawn spring water in the cauldron. And now we need to watch the bubbles in the water, which will tell us the temperature because we do not have any other means of knowing what the temperature is. So interestingly, 
Lou Yu's description in his classic of tea on the stages of boiling water, which we'll talk a lot about today, is the first account that we have of heat transfer to liquids in the history of science. So a very important moment of discovery there. Basically, for Tong tea making, there are three stages to boiling the water. Fish eyes, strong pearls, and mounting and swelling waves. So these are descriptions of the size and behavior of the bubbles in the water in the cauldron that we observe. Okay, so when we get to the second boil, strong pearls, we're going to take out a dipper full of water and reserve it. Once our water reaches the third stage, we're going to place our tea powder in the water, which you can see there in the photograph, and we're going to put a bit of salt uh, into that rolling boil, and we're going to keep stirring that, creating a kind of miniature whirlpool into which the tea powder goes. Now, as soon as we put the tea powder in, it's going to erupt uh, into, into action because the powder is so fine. At a certain point, and again, it's not really clear from the literature when that point is, we can stop the boil by adding the reserved water that we took out earlier. Now we have a tea that is both frothy and kind of grainy because the tea powder is suspended in it. Now it's time to drink it. So we'll ladle it into our tea bowls with a healthy serving of froth and we'll drink it before that froth disappears. So we crushed our tea powder quite fine. So we should get something that is not dissimilar to a bowl of whisked tea made by a Japanese tea master today. But the froth on top of it is supposed to be pure white, like drifting snow. And one of the important aesthetic pleasures of Tang tea consumption is to watch the foam on the tea cool and congeal against the edges of your green celadon bowl. So just to amplify one of the things that I said earlier about the limits of our knowledge, although we can somewhat reconstruct here how, how to simmer tea in a Tang style, it's actually challenging to conceive of the sensory world of Tang tea because tea connoisseurs like Lu Yu, like Yuan Zhen in this poem were deliberately vague about it. They were not specific about it. They chose not to tell us a great deal about it. This is not my image and it's in Fahrenheit, which is a, a measuring system that I don't um, actually understand, but it does show the relative degrees. It does show the relative degrees of temperature that you can assess for water coming to the boil without the use of a thermometer, just by observing the size and patterns of the bubbles. Now there's a whole history uh, a whole backstory to this painting, which I, I don't have time to get into now. It's in my book, if you're curious. Anyway, although this painting is attributed to maybe the most famous Tang painter of all time, uh, it's probably not by him. Uh, it's probably a Sung dynasty composition, so a later composition, but it does show the making of tea in a Tang style in a Buddhist monastery. Uh, here you can see the detail lower left and we'll see uh, that in a minute. So let's look at the detail and see if we can get a sense of what is going on here. Okay, so hopefully this is uh, slightly clearer and you can see, I hope, the tea being simmered in a cauldron on a brazier by a tea master of some kind while a more junior attendant uh, stands by with the white cups in their saucers. Here are the saucers, uh, which are probably lacquer. So the tea master is most likely stirring the cauldron here uh, with his chopsticks, just about to add the tea powder. Anyway, here we have it. A visual image of tea being simmered for elite enjoyment. Uh, maybe it's not Tang, but, but it's a thousand years old probably. And an interesting thing that I think you'll notice as we go on today is that poets often depict themselves making the tea, while painters often depict the tea being prepared by servants, as we see here. And I will leave you to ponder on the social realities of that choice. All right, this is a, a nice poem about drinking tea by the Buddhist poet monk Jiaoran. And Jiaoran was a, a friend of Lu Yu, the author of the classic of tea, very famous as a, as a poet in his own day. 
So in this poem, Jiaoran imagines himself making some fine tea, which has been brought to him as a gift. He's selected his tea, he's lit his brazier, he's ladling out the tea now into a plain porcelain bowl and enjoying the froth, uh, which he compares to the jade flowers consumed by immortals. The three cups of tea that he drinks are completely transformative for his mind and body. There's a, there's a lot going on in this poem, actually, uh, but I just cite it um, here for the way that the poet describes his own tea making practice. So important evidence preserved in our poems. This is um, a later portrait of the Tang poet uh, Lu Tung, and we'll look at a verse by uh, Lu Tung in a minute. Um, if you uh, look at the detail over here on the right hand side, you can see that the preparation of tea depicted here is actually a bit anachronistic. This does not match actual Tang style tea preparation. We have a brazier, um, we have a cauldron on it, or maybe that's a tea kettle of some kind. But there's also this object here, which looks like a metal ewer, which would not normally be used in the manufacturing of simmered tea, um, but we'll see is likely a feature of whisked tea. So it's interesting to see how later poets um, and painters imagined earlier tea practices. Sometimes they were not actually conscious themselves that, for example, Tang people enjoyed simmered tea and not whisked tea or steeped tea. So interesting example there of some kind of tea preparation, but probably not contemporary with the, the poet himself. Now, many of you may know these famous lines from Lu Tung, who we just saw in the previous slide, about seven bowls of tea and their effects on the poet's mind and body. They're actually part of a longer poem about tea and today what I want to do is to rewind to the beginning of the longer verse. Incidentally, you can see here that Lutong's seven bowls owe something to Jiaoran's description of three bowls of tea that we saw in the earlier verse. Anyway, today we don't have time to linger on this part of the poem since we're interested in making tea and not the effects of tea. So this is the beginning of the verse. You can see that Lutong has been sent some high quality fresh cakes of tea by courier from a court official. So this is his exciting Amazon uh, delivery of the day, Amazon Prime, uh, perhaps. The dispatch rider is banging at his gate and he has been sent um, a silk envelope uh, stamped in triplicate. He breaks the seals and he counts 300 full moon tea cakes. So um, a delicious gift of tea. In this part of the verse, he describes how the buds of the finest tea leaves from early spring have been plucked, roasted, packed, and sealed, ready for delivery. These are very high status teas. These are tribute teas intended for the emperor himself. And now Lu Tung gets to try them. He puts on his uh, special hat. So he dons his gauze cap and in solitude, see the poet says, I brew the tea. Uh, in solitude, um, he gets to brew and taste his new tea. And what an evocative um, description here we get of the froth on the cups of tea. It's like clouds of emerald that the wind cannot disperse. He ladles out a cup and he admires the white flowery froth floating lightly on the tea and thickening as it cools and congeals and clings to his tea bowl. So I hope um, by now we are starting to realize that froth seems to have been regarded as the very essence of the tea itself. For the sake of completion and context, these are parts three and four of that same poem, but we don't have time to talk about it today. Okay, so far we've talked about poems, we've talked about paintings, what about the material evidence? So we learned that we need to crush our toasted cakes of tea to a fine powder, and this is the grinder that we're going to use. Well, 
maybe we're not going to use this one because this is an exceptionally fine example made in the imperial workshop and i believe at least uh, never used before it was donated and buried alongside an important relic of the buddha uh, so as you can see this object is gilt silver and we're told that grinders should be made of silver so that they don't taint the tea uh, same with spoons for tea powder those should be gold or silver again so that there's no um, tainting of the of the flavor of the tea so this is the complete uh, object you can see that there is a heavy wheel here that you uh, hold with both hands and you roll with both hands applying pressure for multiple passes over the tea uh, which is in which sits in the groove of the uh, grinder here i'll show you more details in a minute so this is the wheel itself uh, in isolation taken off the grinder as you can see uh, from this view the uh, grooves on the edge remain quite crisp and there's no wear visible on the body of the grinder itself which all of which leads me to suspect that this was made in the imperial workshops um went into the household of, of the crown prince but then was was donated straight away and probably was not actually used in the imperial household until a year ago um i actually believed that the tea grinder from farm and monastery which i've seen uh, very close up uh was the only example in existence um, but uh, last year I learned that another one made in the Imperial Workshops was sold at Christie's the Auctioneers uh, in 2012 for 91,000 UK pounds. It's kind of just about affordable. Um, as I think you can see from this image, this one has actually had some wear. So this one has actually been used and you can see what happens to the, the body of the, of the grinder itself if it's actually, if it's actually used. Uh, this one was made in 872, so three years after the farm and sir one that I just showed you. The uh, date and place of the manufacturer is, is shown up there on the uh, object itself. If any of you watching this live or watching the recorder late, watching the recording later, bought this object at auction, please will you email me? Thank you. So this is a, a very fine example of a tea grinder and more ordinary tea grinders were made out of more ordinary substances like iron or stone. And we'll see some tea grinders in use uh, in later images. So we know that tea powder, tea powder requires grinding and sieving. So here's an accompanying sieve again from the crypt at Farm and Monastery, very fine piece made at the same time as the grinder. And I think again, uh, it's a beautiful decoration here, silver gilt again. And again, I think probably not used before it was uh, donated. This is the beautiful exterior of the sieve. Uh, this is the inside, the actual mesh of the sieve uh, has not uh, survived, I don't think. But we can see the tray, here's the tray into which the powder would have been collected. So a very fine example of a, of a tea sieve there. This is the base just for completion to show you the inscription which tells us about the date and uh, manufacture and so on. All right, another little poem by Jiaran here, our Buddhist uh, poet monk, just to close our section on simmering tea and to remind us of the importance of foamy froth here it is uh, bubbling it makes foam it gathers and gives rise to flowers so the importance of foamy froth in tang dynasty tea so let's talk about how tea was enjoyed in the sung dynasty as with uh, tang methods a tea cake was first crushed with a grinder and then sieved to prepare the beverage the tea bowl was first warmed with hot water a measure of tea powder was placed in the uh, bowl itself and mixed using a special bamboo whisk uh, this is obviously a modern whisk that we're seeing here um, with a little hot water not actually boiling at 100 degrees celsius but somewhere between 80 to 85 degrees uh, the bowl was then filled with hot water 
maybe all at once or maybe gradually and whisked vigorously until a thick foam formed on the surface. This method of preparation is called a dianchar or, or pointing tea. Um, that's how I translate it. Anyway, some people translate this as pouring tea or tipping tea or dripping tea, a pointing tea, I think. Uh, loose leaf tea could also be ground into powder and prepared in the same way. And interestingly, a similar method was also used for preparing medicinal beverages made with powdered herbs consumed in monasteries and in secular life. Now, I realized as I put this presentation together that I actually have not translated any Sung Dynasty tea poetry. So I apologize for that omission. And instead, I will direct you to a selection of images like this one, an imagined scene of the Arhats, disciples of the Buddha, enjoying tea in a uh, Sung Dynasty monastic style. So what we see here is very similar to what is specified in the monastic regulations. So each monk uh, has their own bowl and they have a measure of powdered tea, which is taken from a common store. So you're not allowed to have your own stores of tea um, placed in the bowl. And then the monastic attendant uh, is adding water to each bowl with this metal ewer and he is whisking it in the bowl. So in this image, we see the essence of whisked tea. Hot water is poured in a thin stream from a metal or earthenware ewer into the individual cup that holds the tea powder and the resulting uh, mixture is whisked in the cup. The narrow spout of the ewer, you see it here, allows a good deal of precision in adding water. And some texts specify that water should be added and then the mis mixture whisked for a total of seven rounds to ensure a healthy coverage of surface foam. The temperature of the water we know is crucial for making a uh, good tea. Now, there's still the problem of having no thermometer to know what the temperature is, but now we have the additional complication of not being able to see the bubbles in the cauldron. If you heated the water in a ewer, look at it, um, you, you can't see the bubbles. You had to listen to the bubbles and calculate the temperature that way. So if we try to reproduce the rapid production of bubbles, the size of fish or crab's eyes, which is what some tea connoisseurs specify for the correct water temperature, then we're looking at a temperature between about 81 to 85 degrees Celsius. Much of the Sung tea literature focuses on the production of foam, again, and this is a skilled business that requires a good deal of practice and dexterity with the whisk, as well as the ability to choose the right ingredients and to correctly assess the temperature of the water. All of these things are kind of crucial to the production of foam, which is what you want. So in this image, we see the tea bowls over here and we see the tea cakes wrapped up and uh, ready for service. So here's a detail and uh, here are the tea cups and their saucers. Here are the tea cakes in their wrappings. And here are our, our hats represented as true tea connoisseurs appraising the cakes of tea before they consume them. In this scene, uh, we see uh, in the back there, the collection of fresh water in a bamboo dipper uh, at the rear of the picture. And at the foreground, we see two tame demons uh, grinding the tea over here on the left and tending the brazier over here on the right. Let's talk about water for a minute while we look at this detail of a monastic servant collecting water for, for tea from a fast flowing mountain stream. You can see the bamboo ladle here and you can see the ewer for uh, heating and pouring the hot water. In the Tang, uh, Lu Yu, author of our classic of tea, argued that mountain spring water is the best, river water the second preference and well water the least preferred. As we saw, he also proposed an ideal range of water temperature uh, for making tea. 
Although the method of making tea is different in the song, his theories of water types and water temperature remain in play. Now let's talk about grinding the tea. For whisked tea, the preparer should slice a portion from the cake tea, place it in the grinder here and grind it repeatedly. Some connoisseurs favored uh, silver or wrought iron for grinders. Pig iron um, should be avoided because black dust can collect in it and affect the color of the tea. So how much grinding are we, are we talking about here? Each serving of tea probably requires 600 or so rounds with the grinder to get the powder fine enough. So there's quite a lot of actual manual labor involved in, in getting the powder fine enough. Um, at some points in, in, in Sung tea preparation, they actually used a big stone mill like you would use for making flour uh, and use that in addition to the, to the grinder because it was such a, a laborious process getting the powder fine enough. So here's our complete scene of the R hats, uh, appraising tea, uh, preparing tea, and then uh, drinking tea. So it turns out that there's something about R hats and their tea. This is uh, an R hat painting from Japan, 14th century, uh, that shows very clearly here in, I'll show you in the detail, um, that shows very clearly a stone tea grinder here. Uh, this is a tea bowl here in its lacquer saucer and a ewer here with a very narrow base. We'll see in a minute how the, these ewers were actually heated in a, in a charcoal stove. So I can't tell you a lot about this Japanese R-hat painting, except that, you know, clearly it's based on earlier Chinese models of uh, paintings of R-hats, which who are obviously thought to enjoy tea. Again, um, we see our two uh, monastic attendants grinding tea. Again, so we have a relatively large stone uh, tea grinder here, and uh, the other attendant holds a ewer with a very narrow base. And at the base here, we see a variety of other Sung uh, style tea utensils. The color of uh, the tea bowls is important for whisk tea. Dark and uh, blue glazed porcelain bowls were often favored, but the hair's fur pattern is often said to be the best because it displays the color of the tea most clearly. So tea connoisseurs pay particular attention to the depth, the width, and the overall volume of the tea bowls because these dimensions are crucial in determining the amount of water that you pour into the bowls as well as the action of the whisk and so the color and the foaminess of the tea. When a tea master put tea powder into a dark bowl he could tell immediately how much powder there was and thus, thus carefully control the amount. Next he dropped a little water into the bowl and made a tea paste. The paste would usually be bright green so you get a vivid color contrast right at the beginning of the process and then once the foam is made to cover the entire surface of the bowl and the bowl is then presented to the drinker, the drinker already observes the white foam on it. And then the subtle patterns of the bowl itself gradually reveal themselves to the drinker as he drinks the tea. So both the tea master or tea preparer and the tea drinker engage with the bowl in a variety of ways. Here's a painting attributed to the Sung Emperor Huizong, who was himself quite knowledgeable about tea. Um, it shows a gathering of scholars and uh, includes the, the uh, preparation and consumption of whisk tea. So here you see a main table with the high status guests in the middle. And in the foreground, this is kind of the, you know, the preparation station, um, an area which includes a large charcoal stove down here. Uh, for heating the water. So we'll look at uh, some of the detail here. The figures uh, seated around the square table are, are probably high status scholar officials. We can recognize on the table at least two ewers. Here's one here, here's one over on the left hand side, and there are several light colored tea bowls here, 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 um, sitting on uh, saucers. So in theory, 
and maybe in practice too, light colored bowls are not ideal for whisked tea, but that apparently is what the artist chooses to show here. So here's another detail which shows uh, what's happening in the foreground where the tea is being prepared. If we look to the left, we'll see a, a pretty large charcoal stove and our two ewers uh, being heated for hot water, as you can see, are actually in the stove. So they're not standing um, on it. So this explains a lot about the heating process, um, that the ewers don't need to stand on their bases and be heated from the bottom, but they can be heated from below and on all sides. So it looks to me at least as if the tea has already been ground and um, is in the jar in the center here. And then this servant is measuring the powder into the individual cups on their saucers and they're going to be served. And over here, we see a couple of other ewers standing by for hot water. We see uh, another cup and saucer, other kind of sung tea accoutrements. So we can tell uh, quite a lot from these surviving images. This is a nice example of whisked tea being consumed in an urban setting by non-elites. And it's also the cover of my book, which the publishers thought was great because uh, publishers are always really excited if you, can, if you can show them an image that has lots of people on it because they think, oh, that's exciting. People, people will buy that book. There you go. These tea sellers, uh, which, which you can see with their kind of portable tea sets here, are competing to see who has the best product and the best technique. So you can see that their ewers uh, have relatively wide necks here. Um, so probably the water was heated in a different vessel and added to the ewers and then uh, poured out for the final pour uh, into the cup. So there's a variety in the style of the ewers and uh, their spouts. Over here on the right, uh, just a, a surviving example of a ceramic ewer. So you can see um, the kinds of, of choices being made there in terms of, you know, the, the angle of the spout and the width of the spout and the ability to pour from it, which is the most important thing. The Ming period witnessed the most significant transformations in the way that tea was commonly consumed in China and marked a substantial break with the traditions of the Tang and Sung. Cake tea was no longer produced in the imperial processes, although it continued to be available on the open market. Now we see the steeping of the whole leaf in a teapot or bowl. We see the rise of the teapot as the appropriate vessel for preparing tea. The beginning of the use of Yixing stoneware teapots, the insistence on consuming just pure tea without any additives. All these mark the beginning of the modern mode of making tea. So let me share with you the basic method. In reality, we see a lot of variety of, of practice including a lot of discussion about the necessity for rinsing tea leaves prior to steeping them. So first one boiled fresh water, preferably drawn from a fast flying mountain spring in a water pot made of metal or ceramic placed on a, a charcoal fueled brazier or stove. Meanwhile, one rinsed the whole tea leaves in a colander with warm boiled water. The leaves are then transferred, still warm, to a stoneware teapot that was then filled with the very hot boiled water around 81 to 85 degrees C. Once infused, the tea liquor was poured from the pot into small teacups and the entire pot was drained of this first infusion and the leaves were allowed to remain in the teapot. Additional amounts of water were poured onto the leaves for subsequent infusions on each round, increasing the time of the infusion so that the tea retained the appropriate strength. Crucially, the tea leaves were left behind in the process and only the infusion was drunk, whereas in Tang and Sung methods of making tea, powdered particles of the leaves were consumed along with the hot liquid in which they were suspended. In brief then, steeping tea preparation was considerably less complex and required less skill than methods employed in Sung times when tea leaves were crushed to a fine powder and then whisked to a froth in the teapot. Here are three methods again, probably they overlap considerably in practice. Although we might suppose that the simplicity of steeping whole leaf tea simply drove out the earlier methods, in actuality that does not seem to have happened. I'm gonna show you some material that definitely indicates simmering and whisking methods in use as late as the 17th century. 
But although steeping tea was in many ways a much simpler and less skilled process, some have even called it more democratic, tea connoisseurs in Ming times remain adamant that to be appreciated, tea should be correctly prepared using the appropriate vessels and the best quality raw materials. That's to say, both the tea and the water. Technical advances in the growing and processing of tea in the late Ming meant that the quality of leaf tea was generally much better than it had been um, in earlier times, and there was a greater variety of teas available. It's possible to argue then that the flavor in the leaf was actually more enjoyable. It did not need to be crushed uh, to a fine powder. In this painting, Tang Yin's friend Wu Quan is portrayed seated on a day bed with a teapot, although it does look a lot like a ewer actually, uh, with a book by his side while sharing tea with a Buddhist monk. A servant fans the stove over here, uh, placed on a stone table, while another servant, not shown in this detail, draws fresh water from a nearby stream. So we can see the relative simplicity of the necessary accoutrements for tea if we contrast this scene with others that we've seen today. No grinder is required, no sieve, no whisk, no need even for saucers. Look, he's just drinking the tea bowl with his hand there. Um, bamboo might seem like an unlikely material for a stove, but it's actually made with a bamboo frame and lined with clay. And then it has a cast iron grate dividing the cylindrical upper part uh, and the square bottom. This is a painting also by Tang Yin of his neighbor Chen Shiming, uh, a renowned zither player and expert in the art of tea. Here he's shown in his mountain hut among the pine trees, reading a book and awaiting a guest. We can see his scrolls and his teapot here in another room, a servant is tending the brazier. So presumably hot water is at the ready for further rounds of tea. So this is an interesting example of the reliability of paintings as guides to reality. Look at the teapot in comparison to the size of his head. It's enormous. It's like a catering size teapot. Um, lots of contemporary treatises on tea tell us that teapots should be small, not large. Here's an interesting scene of tea connoisseurs. So we see two scholars in an outdoor setting with a zither and a basket full of uh, scrolls ready to prepare and drink tea. We can see a stove with a kettle and a teapot. Um, in this case, the teapot is clearly used only to steep the tea while the water is heated in the kettle. Now the teapot and the teacups in this image look pretty large, but maybe they're just exaggerated for effect. So I'm gonna read you um, some instructions on steeping tea. This is from the record of tea written around 1595 by a man called Zhuang Yuan. What did people esteem if there was no froth? Check the water and when it reaches full boiling, withdraw it from the fire. First, pour some water in the pot and swirl it to dispel cold chi. Afterwards, pour it out and introduce the tea leaves. The amount of tea leaves should be appropriate to the serving. It should not exceed what is fitting and miss the proper proportion. If the tea is too much, the taste is bitter and the fragrance sinks. If water prevails, the color will be too clear and the fragrance bland. Wait a little for tea and water to infuse together, then pour and divide the tea in the cups and drink. Pouring tea should not be too early and drinking should not be too late. When poured too early, the spirit of the tea has not been released yet. If drunk too late, its marvelous fragrance has already disappeared. Well, this is an example of the continued presence of simmering and whisking methods, even into the 17th century. It does refer to simmering and pointing. And I don't think you can get anything like a milky surface on steep tea. So this must be a reference to tea powder in suspension in hot water, not to whole leaf. This I cite just as an example of the relative portability of tea, assuming that you're steeping it in rural settings. You really only need a source of heat. You don't need to bring with you rollers or grinders or sieves or whisks. It's even feasible that elite males could do this themselves without a servant, although I wonder how likely that actually was in reality. This is just an example of the continued Buddhist associations with tea. So interestingly, even after centuries of whisk tea being the norm in Buddhist monasteries, monks were still simmering tea in the 14th century. And it may be that simmering tea was thought to be a particularly simple and unaffected mode of preparation suitable for solitary hermits. More evidence, I think, of the continued practice of simmering tea well into the 17th century. It's hard to say, honestly, 
whether it was perhaps seen as an archaic or rustic practice more associated with monks than the urbane elite. That's somewhat my impression, but one would need a more systematic survey to be really confident about this. In this case, though, we see tea being boiled on a bamboo stove and not a brazier, so who knows? In any case, I think this is the last verse that we have time for today. So in conclusion, it's, it's important to try to understand what it was that people were drinking and how they were appreciating it. Although, admittedly, there are obstacles to our complete comprehension of that reality, we can at least try to grasp the fundamentals of simmering, whisking, and steeping. What I think we have to avoid is being too quick to reduce what we see in our sources or paintings to our own notions of what tea is or what it should be. So just as a reminder, we've looked at a really thin slice of pre-modern tea culture, that of elite males. We definitely need to expand our social view. So I look forward to seeing the frontiers of our knowledge push back to accommodate the perspectives of women uh, and non-elites. I hope that uh, this talk has been of interest to you this morning and I look forward to our discussions, but thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much for that great talk, uh, Professor Ben. Um, we're gonna move into our Q&A session. Um, a reminder, if you have any questions, please put it in the Q&A box. You need a reminder of where that is. It's the little Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Just click it, a small window will open up and you should be able to type your question in. And we're gonna just jump in because we've got some questions. The first one is actually a comment and a question from Suwako. Um, she writes, this is great. Looking at the temple attendant whisking tea for four monks, I can relate this to the traditional tea ceremony at Keningji Temple in Kyoto. The method is different from the Japanese tea ceremony we see commonly. So now it makes sense that the tradition at Keningji originated in China and was kept in the Zen Buddhist circle. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you, that's a, Question. yeah, that's a very helpful you comment. stone I, mills I, rather oh, than sorry. the grinders, you showed us to grind tea into powder. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question again, Catherine? I, I talked over the top of you. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? I didn't get it. And I interrupted your comment there. Um, yes, we'll go back. The question is, did they use stone mills rather than the grinders you showed us to grind tea into powder? Yes, Have that is a- Any paintings depicting stone mills? Yes, and I, I just didn't have time to um, to share with you uh, any images of, of stone mills being used. But yes, we do. Um, so we know that stone mills were part of the accoutrements of, of making uh, this very fine powder. You can you can see when you look at the tea grinders themselves and 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 you can you can see how much labor is actually required to to get a really fine powder with that. And um, also, if you're making uh, this is a practice that if you're making, you know, individual cups, okay, you can kind of do relatively small quantities. But, it, you know, we saw that scene of the, of the banquet. So let's say you're making tea powder for a banquet or a large number of guests. You know, the volume alone requires you to use um, uh, a stone mill. So we do have images of stone mills. I just, I just didn't share an image today. There, it's kind of like a large cylindrical uh, object, a large cylindrical mill, and it has a, a crank that you turn. Um, and so you, you, place the, you place the tea in the mill and turn the crank and it, and it will grind it in exactly the same way as you would grind flour. So yeah, um, there are such images. If you, if you send me an email, I will, I will send you such a painting. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Sophie. Dr. Ben, thanks for your informative presentation. Could you elaborate a little bit more on why tea was so important to Buddhist lives in pre-modern China? Thank you. Yes, I'd be happy to do so. Um, so 
there are a number of reasons why why tea is is so important in the in the buddhist tradition and why it's adopted by buddhist monks first i think is the proscription on alcohol so uh, buddhist monks are not supposed to consume alcohol and if you think about elite culture in uh, china a lot of it was was based around alcohol consumption alcohol uh, parties and things like that so this uh, using tea instead which is kind of a stimulant and something that can be used to inspire poetic expression something that you can have a kind of connoisseurship around provides an alternative mode to alcohol but it doesn't break the precepts there are a couple of other reasons why it's important and there's they're to do really i guess with the medicinal or physiological effects of tea one it keeps you awake i don't know if you've noticed that but uh, caffeine has that effect and uh, monastics are supposed to be able to stay awake for long periods of time for meditation so we know that that tea was promoted in buddhist circles as an aid to meditation because it would keep you awake it keeps you alert for long periods of meditation at night another thing that it does is to promote digestion so if we think about dietary practices in the buddhist monastery and again put it side by side with meditation if you had a large meal um, you did not want that. Um, you did not want your meditation uh, process to be interrupted by indigestion or flatulence or anything like that. So um, drinking tea promoted digestion and uh, helped the, the monastery uh, function smoothly. So there are, there are those kind of reasons. There's also you know, economic reasons that if you think about where Buddhist monasteries are, they're often on mountain sites and mountain sites are places where you can cultivate tea pick it you can use it for your own consumption but you can also sell it on the open market so there are economic reasons uh, to why buddhist monasteries might be interested in the cultivation of tea and not just its consumption that's fascinating <laughs> i think we could probably uh, hear a lot more about that <laughs> i could do i could do a whole talk on that but yeah Sounds great. We'll, we'll book you. <laughs> um, our next question comes from Gabe. He says, great presentation. Enjoying my cup of tea as we followed along. A lot of the poetry and textual sources you examined focus predominantly on the appearance of the tea, be it in the foam or color. Are there any primary sources that discuss how these varying preparations affected taste? Yes, there are. Um, but this gets into, into controversial areas because um, taste tends to be um, both ephemeral and personal. Um, and, the, and the vocabulary used to describe taste um, doesn't always, you know, match across time, place and personality. I'm saying this because um, I had an experience where, where I was at the University of Venice, which is the, the, the leading center for research on Chinese tea in Europe, with some very kind of, uh, you know, big name, distinguished scholars of tea. And um, there, was, there was considerable discussion, not to say open argument, um, uh, during, during one of the sessions about, about the taste of tea, and particularly, you know whether you could whether whether it was appropriate to use basic terms like sweet or bitter with regard to, to tea and whether and whether you know these were precise enough and if we um if we use them in in translating verse were we being true to the to the poet's original intention so there's a lot of discussion about that so that there are um verses that discuss taste what i would what am i what i would say about it is that in our analysis and translation of those texts or our discussion of those texts we maybe need to examine our own vocabulary and our own translation choices be, uh, before we can um accurately represent what's going on in those poems and that's one of the reasons why I kind of steered clear of the whole issue of taste today, I looked at appearance. But it is an interesting thing that if you look at that if you look at um, Tang verse, 
you know, one of the things that really stands out is the is the appearance of of T. I mean, that's one of the that's one of the things that is a repeated theme, and it and it really kind of stands out. So, uh, yes, it's there. Um, yes, it probably requires a you know more skilled interpreter of the of the materials than I am to to, to render properly. Thank you very much. Uh, next question comes from John. Did black teas have a role in pre-modern China? Okay, so I, I, you know, I left out um, black teas or red teas, um, all of those things. Um, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they really don't appear on the scene until, until relatively late in the 18th century, probably. And, you know, my expertise has, has long since run out by the time we get to the 18th century. Um, I'm a medievalist by, by training, which means, you know, I, I was trained in the Tang materials and uh, which is a, an entirely green tea environment. So by the time we get to, you know, red or, or black teas, I'm, I'm so far out of my comfort zone. I have to kind of leave that to, to somebody else. So yes, they're there. I didn't, I, you know, steered clear of, uh, of talking about any of those things today because that, that's a whole other topic. And in a way, you kind of need to, to have a different training to, to be able to talk about those things. Uh, thank you. Um, the nuances between the different teas I hadn't realized were so complex. <laughs> Oh, it's it's a whole world, and and uh, you know, tea connoisseurs want to you know cut the distinctions even finer. So that's you know they're always trying to you know distinguish: was this grown on the sunny side of the mountain or the shady side of the mountain? That kind of fineness of distinction. Amazing, thank you. Another question comes from Rachel: In the paintings with additional tea utensils, can you point out which are most likely to represent the sifters? And if you're, yeah, let me see, let me see if let me see if I have something that um that so there's not going to be one there. Um, I'm not sure if we can see one that is that is visible enough. Let me let's just go in and and uh, yeah, hopefully I'm still uh sharing my screen there. Yeah, there's not there isn't one that I see there. Sometimes the detail is is difficult to see. So, you know, this box down here is is a is a little mysterious to me. I mean, looking at the looking at that silver uh, tea sifter that we saw the actual material object of it, it's it's possible that that might be a tea sifter with a with a lid. Um, so, you know, because these are these are things that are that are clearly kind of boxed. Let me see. Yeah, I mean, here you can see things like the whisk and the scoop and the the boxes with the tea cakes in it. Um, uh, interestingly, you know, the whisk is so much longer and you know, kind of more loosely arranged than than we would think of a, a, a whisk today. I think, but I don't I don't see a sifter there. So. Um, yeah, I would, I would say that they, I would say that they show up relatively unusually in the, um, in the images. Um, I would, I would have to go back with a, with a magnifying glass and, and go look for one. Good question. Thank you. Another question comes from uh, Gregory. Before we simmer, steep and whisk, what do we know about pre-modern tea cultivation? I understand. What do we this know about? Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Catherine. I think I talked over the end of your question. Uh, just a continuation. Um, it says, right. "I understand that this is outside the scope of your presentation, but perhaps you can direct us to some literature." But we have time if you have something to say about it. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Okay, so what do we know about tea cultivation? So. Um, we know that initially, uh, you know, things were, tea was not cultivated. It was, it was grown wild and, you know, people went and picked uh, it, during the early spring from tea bushes or tea trees. You know, they probably grew to, because if you, if you let tea bushes keep on growing, they, they grow big. Um, 
so so we know that initially there weren't really attempts to 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 deliberately cultivate tea that that it was just left kind of wild um and you know starting in the time you get more obvious tea plantations so people are now um planting tea bushes they're making sure that they are irrigated they are cutting them to aid in um plucking the tea leaves when it comes time to 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 pluck the tea leaves so that instead of having to you know reach up to the top of the tree now that now they're at a convenient height for you to pluck and of course you're 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 pruning them so they grow bushier right um so the 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 place to start looking for um for for uh cultivation of tea is in the classic of tea itself um there there's an english translation by francis ross carpenter which is a an older translation there's a if you read french there is a very good uh, french translation of the classic of tea um by catherine despair who's a who's a very uh, able french sinologist so lou you will will discuss there um a little bit about about the cultivation of tea and then you know from then on it's just a question of kind of tracing it through the specialist treatises on tea that were written in the song and the ming um a trans translations of some of those materials are available uh from a, a man called warren peltier who's canadian um who who has translated some of those things i forget the i forget the name of his book but um it is you know a treasury of 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 chinese tea writings or something like that so we so we have a a, a good deal of 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 textual information uh, we, we we can know something about it it seems that you know there's still kind of a preference for you know tea that's not too cultivated you know tea that's kind of growing a little bit wild and you get like poetic descriptions of of people saying well i'm going to go and pick my own tea i'm going to go up into the mountains and, and pick the good stuff not the you know not the commercial stuff so um it's interesting that you get that discourse you know even as early as the time thank you good question definitely Thank you. Um, our next uh, question comes from Dennis. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. I've never seen a tea grinder. Are any antique models found in any US or Canadian museums? I have never seen a tea grinder in North America. Um, the, you know, the one that I showed you, um, and I'll, I'll go back to it just because it happens to be, you know, a favorite object of mine. So this one is in the Farman temple museum um in shanxi and and if you ever get the chance to go to this museum it's a, it's a fantastic museum it's a really really well done uh museum they have um both the both the original and they and they made these kind of larger models of uh of these tea objects that were that were found in the in the crypt um so you can so you can see kind of a blown up image of the image of the three-dimensional model of the thing which is kind of interesting um and uh this went on loan to the art gallery of new south wales in 2016 or i think 2016 and i was able so i've seen it at the farm and Sir museum and at the art gallery of new south wales where i was able to get even closer to it because it was uh, i just was able to get closer to it um so it, it 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 is an exceptionally beautiful object but i have not seen any other tea grinders in north american museums if if people know of any then um please let me know um and uh this this is the one that was sold at christie's in in 2012 if you go to the christie's website the there was a lot essay written about this image about this object that was sold and the author of that uh lot essay um describes you know where you can see further examples in the in the literature but she does not mention any there that are in uh north american uh museums that i know of yeah i would if if i'm wrong and the, and there are such in north america i would i would love to know or at least not on display at least not what i've seen so thank you good question thank you very much um we have a another question kind of referencing one of your paintings 
uh, Ken asks, what does the dominance of demons, demons in these paintings represent? Yes, thank you. I will just, let's just go to our demons. So this is a really interesting question and um, to, which I, to which I do not have a perfect answer. Um, let's just see them in their context here. So, um, you know, th these images of our hats are from a, a, a series of hanging paintings that were done in Ningbo, and uh, some of them are now in Japan, some of them are now in the States, and so the collection itself has been split up, although these three paintings themselves are in Japan. So it's, it's kind of an imagined scene. So we're seeing the Arhats, the disciples of the Buddha, um, in, a, in a kind of a contemporary, like, you know, 1100 scene. So it's, it's as if the, these figures from the distant past who are somehow still alive are still among us. And I think one of the things that we're supposed to do is to imagine that these Arhats have tamed demons. Because look, you see these two demons here who are carrying this elderly Arhat in on this uh, sedan chair. And then you see um, these two figures down here who are the ones making the tea. So I think that's the, that's the concept is that you're supposed to think that they are, that they are uh, demons who have been subdued by the power of the Buddha and now they kind of work for the, for the Arhats. But if we go back a few, I'll just whisk you back through everything. Um, you're in, oh, well, it was longer than I thought. Um, but if you, if we go back to, to this image, you know, of course, we'll go back to the whole painting. You know, again, these are, these aren't exactly demonic figures, but they're, a, they're a little kind of grotesque somehow, or they're, or they're somehow, they're in a different register than the three main figures here. And so I think there's some kind of residue of, of, of this concept of, you know, how, um servants are, are portrayed um in these demonic figures and then if we go to our japanese our, our hat paintings and i'll just i'll just uh shortcut to these images i mean you know again these are kind of clearly sort of exotic figures um i think in the imagination these are these are not chinese or japanese but somehow maybe Indian because they accompany our hats who are Indian. So this is a really interesting question. I was thinking about it, you know, yesterday as I was putting the slides together and um, thinking, you know, this would, I'm sure this would be a great dissertation topic for somebody in art history, right? Is the, is these, these figures across, across time and space. So I, I think, I think the answer is partly a kind of, you know, doctrinal one of like, okay, well, our hats are powerful figures and they subdued the demons and how the demons work for the our hats. But there's also kind of echoes of, of other things going on here about social status and, and so on that, that, that I think are interesting and, and I don't know the answer to. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Uh, we've got a couple more questions and we have time for them, which is great. That's great. Yeah. Love it. Um, one of our uh, audience members asks, what was the diameter of the tea cakes and how thick were they? Right, so they're, they're, they're pretty, they're, I mean, they could be pretty small. They're really, you know, like a, a circle may be about this big. I'm holding up my, my hands to the camera so you, can, so you can see. So they're not huge. I mean, you get a variety of sizes, but they're, they're pretty portable. And in terms of thickness, uh, you know, somewhere between maybe half an inch and an, and an inch, something like that. So they're not, they're not at all, they're not at all big. Um, and, you know, for, for elite, you of course, you're, you're, you're making these things mostly for elite consumers, the emperor himself or, or the court or whatever. So they're, you know, they're small batch things, right? That you're, that, you know, each individual tea cake is, you're only going to use it for, you know, maybe one or two rounds of, of tea or something like that, depending if you're brewing for yourself or if you have guests coming, but they're not huge at all. Yeah. Another question comes from Sabina. Thank you, Dr. Ben, for a wonderful informative presentation. The whisk tea looks so murky. How has tea drinking with 
its powder evolved to tea drinking as a clear liquid? Right, so this is a really interesting question. Um, you know, this, so this, this idea that, you know, t the, the, you know, this is what I'm kind of saying is that we shouldn't project our own ideas of, of what tea is back into, back into history. If we were, and I didn't even talk about the kinds of tea that you might be served in Tang times that had a ton of additives in them, because people put citrus peel in them, they put dates in them, they put nuts in them, they put pine kernels in them, probably more salt than we would like. And so what you were drinking was something more like a kind of vegetable soup. I mean, it was, it was much murky even than, than we talked about. So this is a really big shift, right? That you, that you go from the desirable form of the, of the tea itself being, you know, basically kind of grainy really, and, and having, being able to have patterns in it to something that is, that is clear, right? That, that what you're trying to get is not any residue really of the tea itself, but the kind of pure liquor that, that comes off the, the, the steep tea leaves. Um, and so this is, this is a big kind of conceptual shift. And I think it really kind of takes time for that shift to occur. And I think what you what you get is kind of you know tastemakers, influencers, making that making that shift and saying, "Let me be different from other tea connoisseurs. I, I I've got a different way into finding the flavor of tea or the true essence of tea, rather than seek it in in you know what's essentially a byproduct of the process, which is foam, which has human agency in it." Let me see if I can get to the true spirit of the tea, which is just the kind of unadulterated interaction between tea and water, these two pure elements, no real human agency involved. And let me see if, let me see if I can, you know, say that my connoisseurship of tea is now superior because I'm talking about tea in a different way. So you, it, I think it begins with, with a few kind of isolated taste makers who are trying to you know, talk about tea in a different way, make tea in a different way. You know, they're probably seen as, as, you know, kind of radicals or whatever. And then, and then eventually, you know, shift, uh, there's a big shift in, in taste. A lot of people have pointed to, um, you know, this 1391 and the ban on cake tea as being a moment where, okay, well, there's a shift to a loose tea here and so steep tea, but that shift is already occurring. You can already see it a couple of centuries previous where, um, you know, people are, people are already clearly enjoying steep tea. So this is, this is always an interesting question. When you get a big cultural shift like that, you know, how do people accommodate it? How do we make sense of it? I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting question. Thank you. Great. Um, we've got time for one more question. Ah. And that is from Dennis. I really enjoyed the paintings with the preparation, preparations and enjoyment of tea. Um, some of your slides had their sources, but can you speak more about them? Any museums or collections or books which you would recommend for study? Okay, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, these materials come from all over, um, you know, they're, they're, they're held in a variety of, of collections. Um, the, um, National Palace Museum in Taiwan um, held um, an exhibition on tea, I think about 10 years ago, um, and their catalog would be worth looking at. Um, the Nara, which museum am I talking about? The Nara National Museum in Nara, Japan, also um, periodically holds exhibitions of uh, tea and um, tea related paintings from China because you know a lot of a lot of materials from China ended up in Japan so those are the places that I would that I would start by looking at the the National Palace Museum in Taiwan has quite a good website um, that is searchable and if you go back through their catalogs um, I think many of which are for sale and now they've started digitizing those catalogs so you can see them in in PDF uh, I think you'll find a, a bunch of material there and the, the Nara Provincial Museum. There hasn't, 
I'm trying to think whether there's been a good exhibition. I mean, there have been exhibitions on on tea in in North America, but they tend to be kind of global. They tend to be not Chinese tea. They tend to be tea worldwide. So there was an exhibition at the UCLA Fowler Museum, I think, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, which would be worth looking at. So there are periodic, you know, exhibitions and catalogues from those exhibitions. But I would say that the that the museums in in East Asia um, have the have the better resources. I haven't seen anything like at the Freer or um, or at the um, or at the Met Museum. But I may just have missed those things. I would start with the I would start with the big East Asian museums. Great, thank you so much. We are at the end of our time. So uh, Professor Ben, thank you again for this great talk and for um, this great q and I wanted to give you um, a moment if you had any closing remarks you'd like to add. So thank you so much everybody for your, for your kind attention. I know it's a lot to um, take in. You know, I wanted to, you know, like I say, it's, it's Zoom time. So I just wanted to present a, a, a wide variety of, of materials just to get you kind of thinking. Um, if thoughts occur to you, uh, then by all means, uh, send them to the email address of First Saturday PDX who uh, hosted this talk today. Thank you to them. Uh, thank you to the people who invited me and to the technical team who made sure that my presentation was able to go ahead. Um, if you um, would like to email me directly, then if you go to my website, which is just my name.ca because I'm in Canada, um, then you'll find my contact information there. I'm always happy to answer questions uh, by email. And I'm sorry that we were not able to meet in person this time. I know that um, the discussion when we do meet is, is always super interesting. And I want to thank you all for taking the time and trouble to, to tune in today and, and to hear something about um, tea preparation methods in pre-modern China. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Professor Ben. Um,